Thank you for being here, Pascal, and, and for help, helping to think about how to close all this. This We've had a fascinating time thinking about all the many, many issues, political, technical, pillar one, pillar two, the views from governments, the views from business, and um, your job is to sort it all out within the next six months. So I, I have a, you know, there's a whole bunch of questions we could talk about, but Maybe maybe the John's last question is a good starting point. What you know, what do you think would be a successful outcome by kind of mid middle of next year? An outcome that's a very good question, and that's there is no easy answer as, as um, the panelists have demonstrated. I, I, I think a good outcome would be an outcome where there is peace where there are no unilateral measures, no trade sanctions, a common understanding of where we're going with a timeline, with an agreement on the fundamentals. And the first of them is the scope. I'm unlike the, the panelists, I think that if there is agreement on scope, most of talking about Peter One, most of the other elements can go quite quickly. And we're taking advantage of the two or three months kind of a, a, a no man's land, right? Because we don't really have an interlocutor with the new US administration. The outgoing US administration cannot be a relevant interlocutor there. Uh, so we're taking advantage of that time to try to see based on the number of options of, of what scope could be, what technical answers to the questions uh, it could be. So, you know, if there is leadership in a sense uh, on scope with the US saying, this is what we want, because if we are here today, fundamentally, it's because the US said, we cannot ring fence. All the countries on earth, including China now, would be happy with a limited scope. It's the US which said no. And then the US proposed something, right? There was a proposal at the level of, the deputy assistant uh, uh, secretary, Chip Harter, who's done a fantastic job. And let me say hello to him as he will uh, be leaving soon the uh, US administration, but he's done a really neat job uh, and he did what he could and at the political level. I mean, Steven Minuchin and Justin Musinich at several G20 meetings were meeting their, their partners, their fellow ministers to um, uh, propose a scope and, and how to share the residual return. So, you know, the issue is with the US. So it's for the US to show leadership and say what they want, uh, how they want to address that. So if the US takes that leadership, the rest I think should follow. Shall we get all the legal detail agreement uh, elements uh, by mid 21? Probably not, but if at the political level, there is an agreement and again, a timeline so that technicians will have to implement a solution, which by the way, Barbara said it rightfully, will have to take into account what the US can do or cannot do, given that there is uncertainty on, on, on the Senate uh, majority. Uh, but as Barbara said too, there, there, there has been bipartisanship on this issue in the US. So, you know, it, it, it goes both way. So short answer is political agreement on the key components of Peter one with a time schedule for implementation, full implementation would be success. Can we do it? I don't know. It depends on, it depends on many elements. Uh, one of them, of course, and the determinant one, determining one is the uh, US position. Okay, and what about pillar two? Uh, pillar two doesn't have the same constraints or the, the, the pillar two doesn't have the same political dynamic. I think the, the, the policy rational for pillar two can be disputed, can be discussed, but in the post COVID world is something which will be very hard to resist. So pillar two has its own logic Technically, philosophically, it is not linked to pillar one. It is linked to pillar one politically by a number of countries. Mike said it and, and some others said, we need to bind them. Sometimes I'm a bit surprised by 
the fact that not agreeing pilot two would be a way to put pressure on the US. That's the view of some continental Europeans. I just don't get it. I think it's not true. Um, so the, the, the divide, the US is supportive of pilot two and I don't see a Biden administration being less supportive of Peter II than, than, than the current outgoing administration. So on, on Peter II, I think the, 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 the real uh, question in terms of dynamic is, is largely a question between the large EU countries, which um, uh, are a bit divided today because of, I mean, because of the fact that Peter II being part of this digital project the digital brand has overshadowed everything, including Pilot2. So if you are in the shoes of the French finance minister, you cannot claim victory. I'm going to get Pilot2 agreed. I'm going to tax my own companies when they delocate their profits abroad. When the main claim was, we're going to tax companies doing business on our territory. Right. I want to tax Google and I end up taxing Louis Vuitton if we want to caricature what could be said there. Not easy. You, you would have needed to develop another rhetoric. And, and I think it's a bit of a pity that we don't have two separate rhetorics. One which is, shall we put an end to the race to the bottom? The US has started it. Why don't we do it? And then you can have a debate. And you have a separate conversation on the allocation of taxing rights and the new nexus, which is Peter 1. They've been bound, but uh, by, by different political process, uh, maybe an, an, untie them would be the right answer, and it may have its own dynamic. I think the relationship between France and Germany, uh, the political level, and, and depending on, on how Pillar One is sorted out at the EU level and globally in the coming weeks, may have some influence on the on dynamic of Pillar Two. Okay, thank you. I mean, you've been very open about the, the process and the kind of political problems, I mean, both on pillar one and pillar two. Can, can I, um, this is kind of a slightly different question, but I think it's, it's, it's still linked, which is, um, I mean, how radical are these proposed reforms? And is this, the, is this the end of the game? So for example, pillar one kind of moves us away from a separate entity approach to a group approach Pillar two is going to introduce, you know, use of financial accounts much more. Both are kind of moving, they both introduce some elements of a formula rate point approach. So we're kind of moving away from the traditional arms length pricing, typical way that we've done it. And, you know, these are, we're kind of beginning to introduce these things in pillar one and pillar two. And I guess the question, you know, if you're looking 10 years into the future, do you think we're going to stop in a year's time or is this going to be a continued evolution towards things like you know more formulary approach more more use of group basis and so on or a destination based cash flow tax that you would advocate you're too modest to mention or even a destination based tax i i don't know that's the honest answer uh, i i i listen carefully to what the previous panelists said and i must say i was astonished to hear from glenn Emenes would be open to formal reapportionment. Emenes want simplicity. Really, Glenn? I mean, we, we need to have a spread conversation. That's not the world I live in uh, at all. Uh, yes, of course, Emenes claim they want simplicity, but uh, as long as they're not impacted uh, by any measure, they oppose any measure. And it's because of all these oppositions that you end up with complexity. So complexity doesn't come from, I mean, vicious mind in the OECD secretariat coming up with stuff which is going to be complex because we're tax geeks and we love complexity. It comes because you need to cope with the different oppositions and precisely because MNEs just don't want to be impacted by anything. And you still have a large majority, if not the totality of business representatives saying the Armstrong principle is great. When you do a public consultation, listen to that. And by the way, the Armstrong principle is all but, but simple. Um, so um, um, I, I, I think what we have ahead of us is two different paths. Uh, one where we keep going with incremental changes. And what we're doing here is introducing more than an incremental change, something quite new, which is formula. By the way, which would have, and that's why I don't agree on the fact that the current 
proposal on scope ADS plus CFB doesn't have its rational or its logic, it does. It's where you have marketing intangible, which by the way was the US proposal. It's where you have a sustained engagement with the market through advertisement, through any other way of interaction. And, and, and where you have a rent because you have valuable IP. And the question is, how do you share that rent? Now you could say all of it residual profit allocation goes to the market. It's too radical. Countries are not ready for that because, because you have too many losers, too many, I mean, winners and, and, and you need consensus. So you need to be either progressive or just give something to market jurisdiction and try to reach the, the balance. So the two paths I have in mind are one, these incremental change, incremental, but still quite revolutionary, and which does address, I don't know whether it's 80, 20, but I think 80% of the transaction are fine with the Armstrong principle, but it's only 20% of, of, of the value. While with the, this formula that we introduce, you may just impact 20% of the transaction, but for 80% of the value. And if you do that, maybe countries will feel much more, um, uh, much happier than they are uh, today. So that's one path and you do that in an orderly manner and you cope with the fact that countries are sovereign and, and they have to agree and it's not easy to agree if you're Denmark and then you lose significant part of your corporate income tax. Or we'll have no agreement because it's too complex, because it's not enough, because the international system actually needs much more of an overall than what is contemplated there. Uh, the conditions are not gathered for a big, I mean, big change, a revolutionary, a revolutionary change. We don't have the institutions for that. We don't have a crisis big enough for that. And, and when I say that, I realized that the COVID crisis is probably the worst for the past 150 years. So if this crisis is not enough to change, I'm not sure that we'll ever have one. Uh, but it will just be the, the international system unraveling and having so much double taxation that at some point MNEs will say, well, indeed, we need a reform. While today, they're not sure that you will have unilateral measures everywhere, or it's just with digital businesses and, and consumer facing businesses with some exceptions. I mean, Amy is from a business um, uh, being in the exception, but, but saying, well, not us. So why would we support something which uh, actually will impact us? Why today we can live with the status quo? So I think there is much too much short termism in the view of, of business, US business, European business as well. Uh, and this short termism is, my, my PNL line is not impacted today, so why would I go for a reform? So maybe after years of unraveling international system, the conditions would be gathered to, to do something more fundamental. But this is clearly not a nice scenario for anyone. And I think it's the responsibility of, of, of political leaders uh, and, and international civil servants to say, be careful what you wish for. The only thing we are sure of is that status quo is not the good old days of the Armstrong principle in a perfect world where everybody's happy and nobody pays attention. Uh, this clearly is over. So just, just building on that, on what, so, you know, we may reach some a consensus next year. We, we may not. Um, I, I, my question is gonna be what happens, you know, what do you think will happen if we don't reach this consensus? But actually the previous panel was kind of worrying what happened, what would happen to unilateral measures, even if we do reach a consensus that they were thinking actually can, countries will continue to, you know, have sales based, gross based taxes. Um, you know, what, what do you think about, you know, I, what, what will happen in, you know, in either case, really? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, one, I think it's perfectly legitimate for businesses to be concerned about that um, uh, and express the wish that if there is an agreement, it's conditional to the suspension, the standstill and the dismantlement of existing unilateral measures. You may have a question of definition, fine, but, but fundamentally, fundamentally, we know what a DST is, right? Um, and, and, and we know what a tax on gross income targeted at foreign companies is. So it's legitimate concern. Now, as always, or too often with business, the concern turns into a big drama and then, oh, we're, we're fearful. No, I think politicians have been extremely clear. The French, if you take them, because they're the most vocal on this issue, they clearly said, 
our DST is over the day where we have an agreement. It's very clear. And it's not a question of money. It's a question of symbolism. And I, I'm not sure there is any single country in the world today which would not be ready to not only stand still, but dismantle measures if there is an agreement. So I think it's a legitimate concern, but let's not overplay it. It will not be too difficult, but it's missing from what we've done so far. I recognize that. If you look at the statement by the inclusive framework, you have a reference to unilateral measure. We should do more. And if there is a good outcome in June or July with a new administration, I think this outcome will list measures that countries will have to commit to dismantle um, uh, or will identify the types of measures that countries would not introduce if the deal is to be implemented. Okay, thanks. We're, we're very nearly out of time and I realize I've been asking you questions. I mean, are there things that I should have asked you, you know, or, you know, what messages would you like to give, if any, to um, the assembled multitude listening on the, or watching at the moment? No, thanks. Thanks, Mike. Well, actually, I've, I've, I've shared it, um, uh, which is um, you should not consider that there will be a status quo if there is no answer, if there is no agreement. It's been years we've been saying that, and I think we've proved right uh, by facts. The BEPS project aimed to avoid this. It didn't succeed as much as it could have, in particular because of the digital conversation. So don't think that you'll be fine. Um, you won't, and nobody will be fine. So that's for the negative part of the message. The positive part of the message is there is room, there is appetite for a discussion. There is incremental, incrementalism, uh, which is, uh, I think, uh, unavoidable and, and, and a good piece of news, I think, for the world, uh, maybe not for academics or for dreamers or for people who would like a good system, but we need to depart from what we have with countries which are all difficult and self-interested countries. Um, so the, the, the good piece of news, I think, is there is appetite. Uh, Barbara said that the US has always been involved in the OECD, and it's true, and it dates back also to her time at the OECD. I, I would even go further. Uh, with the past three years, we've seen the engagement of the US at a political level, more, even more so than in the past. And this is something which will not go away. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that in their first conversations with uh, the new Secretary for Treasury appointed soon uh, or, or designated soon, um, uh, there will be in the top five topics, this topic. Uh, and, and this will not go away. Uh, and not only from European countries, uh, Indonesia, India, and some others are exactly on the same line, uh, not to mention African countries. And so ATAF recently published a, a guide on how to do DST if the OECD process fails. South Africa is there. So, I mean, you have a, a big, big number of countries. So you could say, well, it's all very complicated for actually not much shifted, right? When you look at the numbers, it's not much, it's true. Uh, why, would we, why would we do all that? Now we can bring responses to the complexity, we can simplify, we can try to mainstream the implementation and, and all that, but still, why, why bothering it could be one. Uh, and that's a business view, which I fully respect. But on the other hand, when you look at the political stakes and, and, and the impact on the transatlantic um, relationship, you say, well, is a technical tax issue? Because at the end of the day, defining a nexus and say, okay, in addition to the instrument, we'll put part of the residual profit to the market jurisdiction. For us tax people, it looks like, I mean, climbing the Everest uh, uh, in the bath suit without oxygen. But, but from a new president of the United States perspective, maybe it's not that important. And you have a few other issues to restore trust, confidence, and some form of multilateralism. We need to address climate change which may be much more challenging than this. So shall we try to hurt growth or to increase the recession by another 1%, which is our impact assessment uh, uh, of lack of measures uh, on, on this issue? So when you look at this from, I mean, a, a broader perspective, a political perspective, 
I'm not sure it's worth the fight. And as everybody said, we need to stabilize the system. Would it stabilize it? I think it, it would better stabilize than no solution for sure. Is it likely to bring tax certainty? Yes. And and uh, I mean, Arim was not very long, but, but he mentioned that earlier. Uh, dispute prevention, we could use ICAP as, as a model for for amount A agreement, pre-agreement by tax administration, that could be a sea change. And we have the infrastructure to do that. We have built tax cooperation for the past 10 years. We have the Forum on Tax Administration. We have the Global Forum. We, we, we have the CBCR. We have peer reviews. We have people knowing each other, trusting each other, working with each other. So the conditions are there to do a better job than just uh, you know jumping the guns and uh, shooting randomly. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I, I think, you know, everybody watching and listening will recognize all the things that actually happened over the last few years, including the ones that you just mentioned there. So congratulations on getting us to where we are and um, best of luck for, you know, where you Yes, go. that's what we need. So best of luck. Yes. <laughs> yes. Good luck. It's a pretty hard job, but um, I'm, I'm sure you'll do well. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, Thank you. We've gone slightly over. I'm just going to close and thank you. Before I thank everybody again, let me just um, abuse my position to advertise our, our next meeting, our next conference like this, which will be a book launch. And I've mentioned um, a book which is coming out. It's going to be called Taxing Profit in a Global Economy. It's going to be addressing exactly these things. It's been written by a group of economists and lawyers, and we will be advertising it shortly. It will be the, the book launch will be next month. So do look, do look out for that. In the meantime, thank you particularly to Pascal for being here right at the beginning and the end of this conference. Thank you to uh, all of our panelists uh, on, on both of the big panels. And uh, thank you to many participants who are still here at the end. And um, I've certainly learned a lot to, today and I'm sure other people have as well. So thank you very much to everybody who's participated. Thanks.